Our next speaker is Bill Walsh. His day job is as an aquatic biologist with the Division of Aquatic Resources for the West Hawaii coastline. But today he's presenting his paper as an affiliate faculty member from the University of Hawaii. Bill. Good day. One of the foundations of effective natural resource management is that the pertinent laws, rules, regulations are in fact effective. And one of the key elements of the effectiveness of those kinds of rules and regulations is that enforcement of violators uh, is in fact sure and swift and has a deterrent effect. So my talk today will focus on a historical perspective of natural resource enforcement in Hawaii, where we've come from, where we are, and maybe where we need to go. But first, a moment of silent disclaim. <laughs> I, I would also like to thank Ellen Tong, who uh, assisted with some of the research on, on this project. Well, I'm sure it's not any news to you, uh, if you've been in Hawaii for any period of time, that sure and swift uh, enforcement, if you will, punishment of violators, particularly in, in pre-contact time of kapu, was a key element in maintaining social order and, of course, maintaining the health and well-being of natural resources. Now, these uh, lithographs, which you may have seen before, uh, from an artist, Jacques Arago, who was uh, in the islands on the French vessel uh, Uranie in 1819. Now this was the year right after or the year of uh, Kamehameha's death. So he's representing here presumably uh, some of the uh, judicial proceedings, if you will. Uh, the, the image up on the top is called uh, punishing a violator. The one on the right is strangling a violator. And the one on the bottom is killing a uh, violator. Now, it's not only in, in pre-contact Hawaii that enforcement has been recognized as being very important. It's, it's a key element in pretty much anybody who interfaces with the ocean who uses its resources. We know that uh, both from anecdotal kind of information, but we also know it from a number of surveys that have been conducted. Now, this one is just a section from a 1987 commercial fishermen survey, only surveying commercial fishermen. There were, uh, as you can see in the bottom, over 2,500 uh, mail outs and, and a response of about 280. And one of the questions was, is enforcement of existing regulations adequate or inadequate? And as you can see, the red is indicating that the fishermen from that particular island are indicating that existing regulations are not being enforced adequately. And it's, it's a consensus among commercial fishermen. The other group of, of fisher, uh, fishers, uh, recreational fishers, was addressed in a, in a survey about a decade later, 1998, that uh, targeted 863 fishers. And one of the questions was a little bit differently phrased, would you like to see more enforcement? And surprisingly, although you might think fishermen, you know, hands off, stay away from us, are indicating, at least in this survey, with a outstanding majority of 73% that they would like to see more enforcement. Uh, Kopuna knowledge is obviously important uh, at all levels and 
one of the recent efforts to try to glean some of that knowledge was done by Kumupono Associates in 2003 in a project for the Nature Conservancy, where they interviewed 96 Kapuna and Kamaaina who had uh, in-depth and extensive knowledge of fishing and fishing practices and such. And this is one of the, the pub uh, this is the publication that came out of that. But they, they can, one of the byproducts, or actually products of, of this effort, was a number of recommendations uh, that they were making to whomever would be interested, and particularly, obviously, DLNR, whose responsibility it is to be managing. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting subjects here, but the one I just want to underline at the moment was that they were very strong in their consensus, so to speak, that we need to enforce existing law and kapu and ensure that penalties are paid. Okay? So we know there is sort of an unsatisfied demand for enforcement and increasingly uh, more effective enforcement. So what do we know historically about patterns in Hawaii with regard to natural resources enforcement? Okay, we, can, we can go back as far as 1928. At that time, the uh, Division of Conservation Resources Enforcement, which is the natural res present Natural Resources Enforcement Branch, did not exist. They were part of an organization called Fish and Game, which was uh, under the aegis of the Board of uh, the Commissioners of Agriculture and Conservation. Okay, and they, they became uh, in existence in 1927. But there were reports that are available, and you can go to the archives and pull it out, and that's what I did. So what we're looking at here is that pattern through time of total enforcement citations. This is everything that was done. Okay. And that gap in the, right, in the, in the late 1900s is just information, uh, late 1990s is information that was not available. Okay, one thing that uh, is of note, in uh, 1967, an Act 265 came into effect, and what that did, for the first time, it allowed enforcement officers, fish and game officers at this time, to issue citations and summonses in the field. Before that, if somebody was violating an existing regulation, they actually had to bring the perp to a police station and book them. So it was a very difficult uh, and onerous process, and, and this legislation tried to uh, allow uh, a much more streamlined and real-time approach to uh, management and enforcement. Okay, during that period of time now, the number of, of conservation officers has increased 14-fold. Uh, okay. And you can see that there's ups and downs in the number of uh, uh, total enforcement citations, but uh, we're going from 200 uh, citations to 1,600, so an eight-fold increase perhaps in enforcement citations with a 14-fold increase in officers. Now, if you start to segment the other kinds of enforcements within total enforcements, you see a similar pattern when you look at natural resource citations. Obviously, the number of officers is the same, and it's a similar kind of pattern without a real distinctive increase commensurate with the increase in the number of uh, resource officers. And then if you take that, the total number of citations and the total number of officers present at the time, you can come up with a metric that's the, natural, the number of natural resource citations issued per officer per year. And very surprisingly, the number is actually in a marked decline from the 20s. Okay, so there were fewer officers in the 20s. They were under the burden of having to, to bring to the police station violators, but yet the number of citations and or arrests, this includes arrests as well, was substantially higher in, uh, you know, 50, 60 years ago than it is at present time. And very similar thing if we're looking at just fishing citations, fresh water, salt water, similar kind of pattern, increase in officers, but not a commensurate increase in the number of, of citations, and a very substantial decrease in the number of citation, fishing citations issued per officer per year, with an average now of a little more than two fishing citations per officer per year. Well, how does that stack up with other coastal marine states? Uh, well, here's the information on that. This is based on the two most recent years, uh, the average of the two most recent years of data that we could obtain from each of these coastal states. So Hawaii, unfortunately, is at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, similarly, if we look at the broader uh, 
effort of just natural resource citations, so this would include anything that's terrestrial as well, as well we see pretty much the same patterns as far as Hawaii is concerned. So what happened? Well, the key element, at least to my perspective, is that from the, from the early 20s on, back uh, up, into, as you'll see in a second, into the, to the uh, late 70s, the total focus of the Fish and Game Enforcement Branch was natural resources, okay? And what this graph is showing is the number of, of natural resource citations as a percentage of the total citation. So back in those days, 100% of their citations were natural resources. That's what they did. Okay, a couple of things happened. Okay, the first thing in 1978, Docare, which was part of the earlier fish and game throughout this uh, period, was separated. Okay, there were divisional separations. Uh, my division uh, became separate. Docare became separate unto itself. More importantly, in 1981, Act 226 came into being, okay? What 226 did was profound because it took DOCARE's role and expanded it to include all state laws, county ordinances on all state lands, all beaches, all shore waters, and all county parks. So it took their mission from natural resource enforcement and said, you're going to do everything. And the stated purpose of that act was, as it's written in the, uh, the committee reports, was to enable enforcement of Department of Transportation rules. That's why they expanded their mission. Okay. But what you can see, okay, a, a caveat, is that, that Act 226 said, okay, we're going to expand your mission but the primary responsibility of enforcement will be enforcement of Title 12, which is conservation and resources. That's in the Hawaii, Hawaii Revised Statutes. Okay. So from that point on, you can see a very distinct change in the proportion of citations that are devoted to natural resources. To, to now, we're looking at essentially uh, a third or so of citations being natural resource and two thirds being anything but, being all kinds of other sorts of activities. Another way uh, that isn't looking at citations, this is uh, in response now, uh, DOCARE was subject to a legislative audit. One of the requirements of that audit was for them to report their activities in terms of uh, hours spent doing this and doing that and doing that. So they have codes for different kinds of activities. So I went back for the most recent month that was available. This is available on the DLNR, DLNR website to anyone. And this is June 2007. This is one of the outer island branches. There's 25 officers here and 3,645 man hours represented for that month. Okay, so these various sections of the pie then represent hours as defined by the DOCARE officers on their their hourly, monthly reports. Uh, you can see aquatic resources, 13.5% of their time was aquatic resources. Land resources, 11.5. State parks, beaches, 8.8%. Non-resource, this could be anything from drug interdiction to historic preservation to boating laws. And a very substantial portion of this is cruise ship security. And then administrative and support, that encompasses everything from you know, maintenance of, of vehicles and cars and, and report writing and so forth. So it's a, uh, a very big sector. And if you take that administrative support then and just say, let's divide that up based on the proportions of these other uh, identifiable sections, and we can end up with something like this, where about 47% of present do care activity on this outer office, which may be typical, which may not be typical, I can't say at this moment, uh, for that month of June, which I can't say is typical or atypical, but at least it is for June, has nothing to do with natural resources. And some people would argue, well, state park, being in state parks could possibly have something to do with natural resource enforcement if somebody's pulling up some plants or something, but if you're issuing uh, parking citations in, in the state park, that is not a traditional 
fish and game kind of activity. So uh, maybe as much as 60%, at least according to these hourly things, of, of doe care present activity is not natural resource enforcement. Okay, then the question goes back to that Act 226. Is, is this, is 60% of non-enforcement activity adhering to a primary focus on natural resources of Title 12? I don't know. I doubt it is. Uh, and then the question is, where is our natural resource enforcement arm if most of their activity is not directed towards natural resources? And the key element, as I'm going over and over with this, is legislation. It was legislation that did this, and it didn't really provide a solution. And we seem to have run into a little bit of a problem. But then, of course, the other aspect besides enforcement, which I'm just hammering home here, and this, I think, was articulated pretty nicely almost 75 years ago by a fisherman, as captured in Emerson's Ancient Hawaiian Civilization. And he said at a meeting, laws today cannot help to preserve the fish in Hawaiian waters unless, in addition to the laws, we have a feeling of respect for them and observe them because we see that they are beneficial. So enforcement, obviously, yeah, it's important, but the, the individuals themselves have to maintain their personal responsibility. Thank you. Oh, 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 May ho o ha ma u ta le o ka le hu a pa ne a pa ne mai pa hai ke ya ma mu e